Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Alazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today we have an episode uh, regarding uh, a specific topic, which is the relationship between the own brand labeler or private labeler or virtual manufacturer and the OEM, which is the original equipment manufacturer. This is a model that is existing uh, since a long time and uh, with the new medical device regulation and in vitro diagnostic regulation, we can maybe have some changes. So I received a lot of questions regarding that. And uh, I decided to invite a, a person, somebody that can help us to understand this model and also provide us some solutions. So what should we do if we are a private labeler or if we are an original equipment manufacturer to continue business and to, uh, to do that? So for that, I have Stefan Boleininger from Beyond Quality. And uh, he will uh, really be our expert today to explain us this model. So welcome, Stefan, to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Hello, Monia. Thanks to be here. So great. great. So Stefan, so can you introduce yourself for the, for the audience? Sure. Um, hello, I'm Stefan Boleininger. I'm a consultant and owner of the Beyond Quality company, a medically wise consulting company like you as well. So great. And where are you located? Uh, we are located in, in Nuremberg, next to Erlangen in Bavaria in Germany. Right. And our focus is medical devices with active ingredients or also everything with electricity or software. Oh, great. So, uh, so we'll, have, uh, we'll have you explaining us this model, which is the OEM and OBL or PLM model. So uh, let's start the directly uh, with the, the first question. So what is exactly uh, the OEM and OBL model? Okay, um, that is a very good question because if um, in the past we had also we have an, a PLM, an OEM, an OBL, we have every kind of different names and definitions which makes completely always in the same direction. I need someone as an OEM, as a, as a PLM or an OBL, I need someone who does everything for me and who I can claim he is, it's all his fault. Okay. That, was the, that was the operation as a principle of the OEM PLM procedure. So, okay, and now since everything is more modern, we have a new word that's a virtual manufacturer. Yeah, true. It's, well, nearly the same, but it sounds more polite, more sophisticated. It and has a bit of different changes, which are maybe quite good if you have specific devices to be sold and if you live in UK. Yeah, exactly. Because I think this word virtual manufacturer was introduced by the MHRA. I saw that the first time in a guidance from the MHRA and everybody was asking themselves, okay, now we should not call that anymore OBL or PLM, but maybe virtual manufacturer, which sounds better, if I can say. <laughs> uh, definitely, definitely is better. And well, it's for most manufacturers and most companies, it is exactly it's still the same. However, new naming and industry 4.0 makes it more fluent, more sophisticated. And now we have virtual manufacturers. Earlier, we had an OEM. But at the end of the day, we need to deliver safe medical devices. That's our business. That's the job. So no matter how we call it, we need a device. And in the past, it was quite easy because we had, well, I'm from Germany. In Germany, we have specific, yeah, specific cities, towns, and uh, um, ecosystem around that companies who have are very good in selling devices to another one, to another one, to another one, and rebrand it every time. That was uh, well. I think it is. I think the first place of OEMs are in Germany. Okay. I'm not sure if that's definitely the right answer, but that I think so, because I there is a specific region which have it quite used and very often introduced. However, well, it has their, it has opportunities and it has their own weaknesses. And unfortunately, now with NDR, the weakness of the OEM PLM or OEM OBL procedure increased. Okay. Yeah, because it's, we all rely on safety. So, and so, so the idea is mainly that, uh, as you mentioned, so the OEM is the one manufacturing the product, uh, putting all the efforts in terms of the design, in terms of the manufacturing, in terms of the cleanliness, etc., packaging and everything. And at the end, they are selling these products to uh, OBL or virtual manufacturer or PLM, who has just to put his name on it, if I can say, and just to say, 
this product is my product and I sell it on the market. So we have in one side the manufacturing and in the other side the marketing, if I can say, which is the current model that is existing now. Yes, that's a model and as a MDD. And it's a, it's a, it's a renewable and a good model mm -hmm. because if you, if you focus on the things you can, if you focus for selling, if you focus on manufacturing, you're good at it. Yeah. So, and that is the model has its value. It has its, yeah, has a good intention, a charm on it, which is, yeah, might be very good. However, it also has a few weaknesses because if you share the responsibility of the complete system of a complete medical device between the OEM and the OBL, then, well, you need to share the responsibility and make sure, make sure that the chain will not break up. Yeah. And that is quite hard for both sides because if you are, if you are the, OE, the OBL side, which is, yeah, a very interesting side because you deal with a customer, you deal with specific people who want to use your product or need to use your product, and you need to deal with a notified body with a product that's not, it is technically yours, but not really. And you rely on someone else. So you need a very good trust. True. And that trust is, well, um, uh, it's mostly from the American standpoint, in God we trust, all others bring documents. So I bring the documents and look on it and that's it. So that is past, that's the current model with the MDD that we trust in our OEM and our good relationship. That's okay. Because the OBL has a focus, the customer. He needs to ensure that the customer gets his best possible points and he is ensuring the regulatory landscape from that side for registration, for notification with notified body, with the information, dealing with competent authorities, dealing with complaints, and then deal it back to the OEM. Yeah, like um, a very highly sophisticated manufacturer or a supplier. And that chain is for the OBL and the P or called PLM, that doesn't matter. And um, for this one, it is a crucial step. And with that, now with the MDR or also the IVDR, the so OBL who will be inspected by, the, by his own notified body, this one needs to have access and control and the full control over the technical file. This is, what, this is what is written now on the MDR. It's, it's black and yeah. white, if I can say, on the MDRs or the IVDR saying they should have full control of the uh, technical file. This is that. Yes, that is correct. You find it in the Article 10. You will find it in the, huh, I think it was Article 10.4, where it is stated in a little, little sentence below the idea, um, the manufacturer has the obligation to provide a full technical file to the notified body and the competent authorities where the notified body or the competent authority can check compliance. If you, yeah, if you need that, you will need to bring a document which includes a full technical file with everything included to make sure that you're in compliance. And then comes a nice point. It's compliance against the NX2 and the NX3. So the first thing as a OBL or PLM, I need to look into my eyes, look into the document and say, well, we need to make sure that we have everything to state compliance because we, we, the PLM, we are responsible. Yeah. And that means I, as a PLM, need to make sure that I log into the general safety and performance requirements and make sure that I can address them adequately. And then, yeah, there comes a discussion about adequately so, and control. Exactly. The, 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 the big, I mean, the question I always reserve is, uh, okay, what does mean exactly full control? What does mean exactly, I mean, there is a lot of interpretation on this sentence. Does it mean, yeah, I, the, the design is my product, the, the, the product is completely mine. I, I mean, there is a lot of, of, uh, of interpretation and I think Maybe the intention was not really that. So there is more like, as you said, we try more to be, to, to provide a, a secure product for the patients. And for that, we need you to take responsibility and maybe full control doesn't mean really full control. This is that. 
Yes, um, if you drive a car, I, 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 I try to explain it in a, well, in a very open phrase. If you drive a car, you're in full control of the speed. Okay. No, you're not. Your gas, your, um, your pedal and also your, um, your engine cells are in full control of your speed. You're not. You think you are in control. And that's the notified body pushes on the, on the pedals. And the notified body says, okay, I will have someone because I can't have full control, but I can try to steer and, and work with it. So I need someone who has full control. I need the one with the engine. And the engine is the manufacturer. And the manufacturer needs control to ensure even if he, the, manif say, the engine of the, uh, of the car does not know on which street it drives or what's the, um, as, as the roughness and the, and, the, um, and the ground which we drive over because that's a part of the, of the wheel. Um, but the manufacturer or the engine needs to ensure that he has the control to steer the wheel in a perfect way and demands from the notified bodies push towards to the wheel and to the street. So for that means I need as a manufacturer need to ensure that I have the possibility in a technical way, in a qualified qualified way, and also in the organizational way to get everything towards my notified body to see to give him the confidence that I know what I will do. Exactly. That is the what means control. Exactly. It is access and valid validity. It's nothing more. And well, if you deal with the notified bodies in a few ways, you get, well, different answers. Okay. Yeah. But in most cases, with most notified bodies I have spoken, they told me, Hey, you all work in an overall system with different manufacturing sites for one product. So why should we have a more sophisticated approach for a small company, OBL? instead of a multi-site global company and say, okay, when I audit your technical file, you can prepare it forward to, to me when you have to send it in, that's one point, or when I inspect it, I accept that you need to prepare the file I want to see in your uh, data, con uh, data container, in your document control system or whatever. So if it takes four hours to get all the documentation, that is the way. So most notified bodies accept if you say, okay, yes, I can prepare everything for you, what you need to state conformity and compliance to the MDR if you bring it within four hours. So four hours, first, in this year, it, it, that's my first incentive. Four hours is a way that time you can, you need to cooperate with your OEM. Okay. Because the respond needs to be done within four hours. Great. Um, so for this episode, um, I wanted to focus more on the OEM or PLM or virtual manufacturer side. And um, we will record so uh, another episode for next week uh, regarding the PLM because I, I don't want to overwhelm everybody with a, a two hours episode, if I can say. Uh, so, uh, so let's focus now on the PLM. So what as as the plm will be the one that is um talking to the auditor and um going in front of the auditor during uh, during uh, the certification so uh, what are the regulators looking for exactly in terms of documentation is there kind of a, a something a, a secret source or recipe that we can provide to the to the people <laughs> well um yes it's a human sense <laughs> but that um, de depends on which human you ask. Yeah. So no, um, you have two, two real needs. So organizational need, so one, and the second one is the technical need, how to get the documentation. And the third one is the in amount of information which you need to be transferred. So what I do is, okay, when I work for a PLM or the OBL, I go to my documentation what i have for my product so what do i have as an OBL, obl or as a plm i simply have well a device a description of my device what it shall do my purchasing specification towards my oem my information about the intended use the complete intended purpose of a device yeah a bit of validation because i need to make sure that i sell the right products 
And that, that's in many cases, unfortunately, that's all. And then I have one very, very strong document. And that's a quality agreement with my OEM. Okay. Because in this one, that's it's the first piece of my secret sauce. In that one, I will challenge everything for, okay, what is the, how can we handle changes in the product? How does the, um, how does the OEM transfer it to the PLM? Nothing new. Then who handles responsibilities for uh, post-market surveillance? Who handles for me as an, since I as an OBL need to have a UDI or a registration, who handles that in which way? What is my kind of UDI I want on my products? Because I need to sign the declaration of conformity at the end of the day. I need to ensure that I have the information. What is my UDI DI and my basic UDI DI? That's my knowledge, my information I need to do. And also field safety corrective action. And then one thing, which is also introduced since 2013. Yeah, you also, as an OEM, as a supplier, the supplier needs to be audited if it's a critical one by the notified body. And that is, that's one thing which we always can rely on in our complete business. And that's the confidentiality and the professionality of the professionality of a notified body. That is a thing we need to rely on, we can rely on. Because if my notified body goes to my OEM and inspects them, well, maybe I get a few, well, not very polite letters from my OEM. Okay. That's the notified body is going to them. However, the notified body goes to them inspects the technical file and the documentation if needed, and provides a statement about compliance. And that statement of compliance ensures the OEM's business. So but, it's not a bad thing. Yeah, but when you describe me all that, it looks really similar to a relationship between a, manufacturer, a normal manufacturer and its supplier, because you still have your technical file uh, with the information, you still have your quality agreement to define who is responsible for what, and you yeah. don't know also all the secret source of the supplier. You know, for example, we have to do um, uh, maybe some cleaning or maybe some passivation or something, but you don't know specifically how they do that. They just do it as, as we require to them to do it. So this looks similar. Is it or is there really a, a difference? In this, Currently, it is still it is similar, but then comes the second part. The second part is what I expect from my supplier, from my OEM, and what kind of documentation I need to look at it. So, since change control is also part of the standard OEM, and it's no big deal, so I need, I have a customer specification, whatever kind of functional specification, which I give to my OEM and I want a feedback on it. It's a statement of true compliance where they say, okay, these are my documents I'm using and these are the documents I get from my OEM and I normally I accept it in kind of a, of a stat file. Okay. Because with the stat files, the OEM is safe enough that it this does not give me every information. Mm -hmm. I have control about a document and a version of your document. And with that, I can make a basic compliance check against documentation. Okay. It's not sufficient to have everything included for the secret source of the OEM. I don't yeah. get on that directly. However, I get in on it on in the point of what is the most feasible items and information I can get from my supplier to ensure that my compliance check against the NX2 and the NX3 is sufficient. That I can do, that I, and that is for me, I always demand on a stat file from the supplier because it's no rocket science and it's very good. So then comes one additional point, clinical evaluation. Yeah. I always demand on the full clinical, uh, clinical evaluation. However, Clinical evaluation is public available information. That's nothing which is IP protected from the, from the OEM, so they can deliver. I demand on the risk management file at least, the risk analysis part. Not all of the mitigation parts, that's not all needed except those which are in the labelings, because then I can trace them through the stat file from risk to labeling, and I need this kind of information as well. So, yeah, it's not, it is not perfect. Yeah. The way to get, as a PLM, it is a way to get compliance and justify my 
GSPRs to say, okay, I did everything I need to do, and I have for every everything which is needed by technical file assessment for my notified body, and everything which I have as a demand from the notified body of committed authority, I have a correct answer. If we need to dig more into the answer, then we need to go to the OEM. So this is this is the point now. Uh, so. Let's say now you prepare your documentation, you have everything that you think is fine. Talk, 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 the auditors are coming. <laughs> they are coming to certify you. So uh, you are in the front room, you are showing them the documentation. And at one point they say, oh, but there is something I want to dig more in. It's not on the technical file. Uh, can you show me uh, some a specific document? But the PLM or OBL don't have that, that document. It's with the OEM. So yeah. what would you um, advise the, the people to do, if I can say? Yeah, that's also part which I have in my, within the quality contract or quality assurance agreement. Okay. To have, if my notified body is, yes, it, it, in, my, in my most reason, in most, yeah, in most situations, it does not come out of nowhere. It came with a reason or with a plan. So we okay. know about it. And I can inform my OEM suppliers that they will come in. So what I'm doing, I set up a basic information between the front room and the OEM, a communication protocol like, well, you can use whatever you want, open meetings, you can use Zoom, or okay. you can also use Skype for Business. Okay. To, make, to make it possible for the notified body the auditor to go directly in the documentation. So, and by that case, what I am doing in that reset, I give the OEM the control to show the auditor everything the auditor needs to see by screen sharing. And during that, um, it's, it's a protocol starts in the following way. The auditor comes, so it is in the, is in the office, looks at it, he wants to take into a specific kind of algorithm which is privileged information. Amateur A says clearly, okay, yeah, you, you're not allowed to stroke out and black out every kind of formula or algorithm, but if you have some algorithms which are very privileged for you, you can stroke them out prior to sending the documentation to the PLM. So that's the same way I have. I mean, with the stat file, I have a few of the informations, but not all. If the auditor needs to go more into the details, he tells me, I need to see this. Okay, then I make a call with my OEM, set up the, um, the protocol that they can sh uh, share the screen. So, um, and then I, as a PLM, go out of the room. Okay. And leave the auditor and the OEM alone so that the auditor can justify, according to the documentation with the OEM, that everything is included. So. And down here, here comes one big catch. This catch is you need to make sure that your OEM will not tell the auditor about other documentation than that is in your stat file. If the info, if, if he tells you about a document which is not in the stat file or has a new, newer version than your stat file, yeah, the auditor will get really pissed because so that means you don't have control. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a kind of a basic training of audit management, if I can say. Just answer the question. Answer yes or no, if possible. If you ask more, answer the question, but don't answer yes. a, a question you never asked. So don't, don't, don't give him more information than what he requires. So it's, as I said, basic, really basic uh, audit, audit management. Right, so what does that mean for the OEM side? It means that the OEM needs to know what is the latest state file you got. Okay. To get only the documents you are reflecting. So if they can reflect and say, okay, so with the state file, the auditor has the evidence that what is happening with the file on the OEM side, the auditor can inspect the evidences that they are controlled, available, and that will well, with the notified bodies I have spoken to and the auditors, is that will work out. They say, hey, we need to make sure that every business has its opportunities and it has a possibility. And if we get a safe medical device by sharing this, it's okay. That's no big thing. We need to make sure that we get evidence and safety in the devices. If we get it by that way, it's okay. 
And also then with the stat file, the RSR version numbering was specifically in, integrated of each file. If the OEM tells me that is the correct file, then I'm pretty safe in a way. Yeah, and uh, as you mentioned, so the the record management is also important. The archiving is also important. So uh, if your OEM is not uh, kind of um, well trained or is not uh, kind of uh, educated in terms of doc recording, uh, versioning, etc., it can be also uh, a problem. So the selection of the OEM and the selection of a, 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 a professional uh, manufacturer is also key to avoid future issues. Because if you start to build your audience, uh, start to build your customers, start to build your marketing thing, and at the end, you cannot sell just because the OEM is not really a professional manufacturer, it can be also a, a big problem. Yeah. If you want to build a house, you need to make concrete. Okay. And if it's on your manufacturer, on your manufacturer, supplier, or OEM side, if that's not sufficient, if it's not, pro not professional, not trained, or not qualified sufficiently, then this will not work. And, and, uh, and, it, and mainly uh, uh, the auditors do have another secret weapon, if I can say, they can go to audit the uh, OEM directly. And it's something that you have also to include in your quality agreement to authorize that because if they refuse, you can lose your certification, if I can say. Yeah, if it's a, um, a OEM is always a critical supplier. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That way, yes, but that's also since 2013, it is uh, that way, I suppose, don't, don't nail me on that, but I think it was 2013 yeah. when that was introduced in Europe, said a critical supplier can be audited and you need to change your QA for that. Yeah, but for with, as, an OE, as an OBL or PLM, I need to f focus on the way that everything from the from my side, from my view, will be in order to make sure I have sufficient controls about the documentation of the out technical file. I can do that with my information I have with the stat file, make my own compliance check to fill my own GSPRs, to have my own UDI introduced, to have my product labeling introduced completely. That is the thing what I can do. And with the OEM, the OEM who maybe does the rest of the device creation, also design um, and de uh, design and development or the uh, manufacturing, design transfer, everything, I need to have the end product more uh, completely under control and also the major. The end control, I can see, I can check it, and that's also a thing that I, as an PLM, always do. I have a set of criteria for about the packaging. So if I don't have control about the inside of the manufacturing side, I can control what happens within my warehousing, my stock. When the products came to me, I can make a batch record and check product audits, look into it. That's also a thing which, uh, which increases the confidence that you're knowing what you do. One additional thing that uh, the MDR or IVDR is asking uh, for any manufacturer is to have a PRRC. Uh, person responsible for regulatory compliance. This is maybe something also new that will come to this um, OEM OBL uh, model because I suppose uh, the OEM had more like the manufacturing part, but maybe some quality parts, and the OBL had more the marketing part, but maybe less quality or less uh, regulation stuff. Uh, so this is maybe something also that can be uh, increasing uh, transparency and increasing confidence to the the OBL model. So yes. Um, Unfortunately, the OBL or PLM needs to have one person responsible for regulatory compliance to fulfill and check all the duties of a legal manufacturer, the complete Article 10. Yeah. He needs to ensure that the complete Article 10 is introduced and also the technical file is completely checked. So that means, as a person responsible for regulatory compliance, I need to ensure that I have everything in the stat file that helps me to get to the documentation. I've seen for um, a few months ago, I've seen a, a, um, a device manufacturer, a very good device manufacturer, and who has the first time in ever he had another software introduced into their devices. Okay. And then that means so, from that is, uh, it says some company delivers a kind of software, that's fine, they are certified. However, also the manufacturer needs to ensure that he has sufficient knowledge to make sure that the software is compliant. If he has not 
on software engineer or something like that, which is also fine. He needs to at least ensure that the process creating the software is controlled. That's why we have standards on it. So, so you control the standard, you control the documentation on it, which comes towards to you. With that, you control the content of the device. And that is the same. The person responsible for regulatory compliance needs to be on the OEL PLM side and needs to ensure that he has sufficient knowledge about the device. And that can, he can do that by inspection of the documentation, which comes in, inspection of the OEM, which is more or less very hard because it's, um, that is a, um, well, it's, it's a high effort to inspect and audit the OEM. Or they can go and make a product audit in their own warehousing, which costs one, two products per batch. But they can state that still everything is fine. So, and then we have one little different clause again in the MDR. And that means, well, it's not a different one. It's normally it should be human sense. So manufacturer shall keep the technical documentation up to date. Yeah. And um, well, I'm pretty sorry is that this kind of sentence got into a regulation because I thought that is human sense. However, we need to deal with that sentence. That means there needs to be a regular basis where in which point, time point where the PRC from the OEM and the PRC from the OBL get connected and check against that, that file and the technical documentation to make sure that everything is included and every documentation is updated and the stat file will be renewed on a yeah, frequently basis. I would do that at least every year. Okay. Or if the product is not critical every two years to make sure that I have everything. Also, then I get my clinical, uh, clinical evaluation again. I get an updated risk management and one thing what an OBL simply can check is if a new standard, which is crucial for you, will be introduced and you don't get an updated documentation, then you have something missing. Okay. That is quite easy because you can check it with the official journal. If it's in the official journal and you a new standard and you don't have information from your OBM or from your OEM that that standard is now included and you hear, here you are with the updated technical file, with your updated set file, then you have a mismatch. And you have a mismatch and you get set quite cheap to get this kind of information, then you don't have the control. Okay, so it's a good uh, test to, to see that uh, all your system is, is, uh, is working quite well. So uh, in, if we make a summary now regarding the, the PLM, so um, what we said is mainly that to continue or to sell the products um, in Europe, uh, we need mainly to uh, sign this quality agreement, which is uh, something that is really, uh, I mean, I think it's the, after the technical file, I think it's the key document. It's really the document that is, uh, that is um, putting really the relationship and uh, defining who is responsible of what in front of the, of the, of the auditors and which provides also uh, some, some key information because the auditors will, will check that. So I think this is first this one. Then we have uh, the, the, the also the possibility for the auditors to audit the OEM. So they have to be, this has to be included and agreed and uh, not like, uh, yes, you can do that. And when they will knock at the door, no, no, you cannot enter. <laughs> it can be <laughs> the big surprise that can happen. So having that is fine. And as we said, the first one is really to build a technical file that uh, answers all the, the requirements of, of the MDR. Did I summarize, uh, summarize it well? Yes. So organizational organization part with the quality assurance agreement to yeah. make sure that everything is in order to fulfill my duty as a manufacturer according to Article 10. That is the first thing. And the second thing is my summary of technical documentation is that our linking table, our compliance checklist, however you can call it. For me, it is a abstract of the real technical file, the set, which helps me to ensure that I have everything included without getting into every kind of documentation. And these documents are the ones who are for me personally the most important. Because with that, I can check the technical one, I can check against 
do I have everything? And with the organization, I make sure that it will work out if someone comes, like a notified party, the competent authority, or if there is something happening with the OEM or with the um, field safety corrective actions or whatever. There are plenty of things which can happen to that combination of a virtual manufacturer to a real manufacturer. There are plenty of things. And these things need to be covered in that. For that is the field safety corrective actions, complaints, risk management updates, periodic safety update reports, who will file what and in which circumstances, then the complete vigilance system as a shared responsibility, the audit possibility and the technical way, how is a notified body can have quick access to documentation. Good. One, so, one thing one thing I will have with the technical documentation inspection by the notified body. Okay. When I yeah, when I recreate my certificates and need to check my technical documentation by the notified body, I need to send it. So in most cases, I need to send it to the notified body. Mm -hmm. In that circumstances, it is not possible for the auditor to make a quick preparation with a dial in to the OEM. Okay. So what I'm doing there, I will, with a notified body, and it works out with most notified bodies quite well, we make a time frame at which time it is possible to have the auditor available to dial in into the framework. So it, it will cost four hours, five hours of review time for the OEM and the auditor. But these four hours will solve out every problem or if a problem remains, then I have a real one. Okay. Which I don't help. But that is also, that's the one thing which is some kind a bit hard, but that's also, and that is the technical part, how can the notified body get into the documentation? Preferable? I'm not using the real man in the middle, a man in the middle um, protocol, like someone who prepares the technical documentation towards the notified body and something like that. Because that is mostly harder if the OEM tells the documentation to a different to another one and this one tells it to the notified body. Okay. So why don't they communicate directly? Yeah. It's easier. So OEM has control about what he shows uh, and the notified body can lock what he needs. That's easier and contains uh, is better in the containing of the model. Great. But it will still make it happen that we have OBL and PLMs still in the market with MDR. Yeah, I, uh, I, it's, it's mainly, I think, the, the good sentence for, for the end of this episode. It's uh, to say that this model is not dead. Uh, we heard a lot of time that maybe this model is dead. And even me, I, I, I said that. Uh, but yeah, after um, many, if I can say, discussion and a review of the, the MDR, I think we can be confident that this model is not dead and we just need to uh, increase collaboration between PLM and, and OEM for that. So Stefan, um, uh, what, so can we talk more about now beyond quality? So what is beyond quality exactly? So what are you exactly doing? And as you mentioned, you are uh, working mainly on uh, combination products and electronics, uh, but uh, what, uh, what is exactly your, your work and how can you help people on that? Okay, um, that depends. Um, we are a consulting agency for medical device quality management system, regulatory affairs, and also registrations for specific countries. And what we are doing is we try to deliver yeah, solutions for our customers to make it possible to get a quick way to get a good and straightforward way to deal with regulations, especially with MDR and with um, also with US and Chinese laws and something like that and Japan. But um, focusing now with the MDR topic, we are helping quietly with the installation of the new quality management systems with setup of the correct information needed for having the person responsible responsible for regulatory compliance, the circumstances, what they need to deliver and how they need to prepare and update the technical file. That is some of the things we normally do in our daily life when we are not talking on podcasts. Okay. <laughs> and I, I suppose I suppose MDR is now a, a big part of your of your job, I suppose. Yeah. Um when I'm on the um on um uh, presentations or when I have a few speaks, and normally I say give all the um um I tell on this point that well when I was eight 
there was the draft of the MDD available. And okay. there's a evidence, documented evidence by picture that I read the MDD when I was eight. Okay. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I have no clue what was in there, but I don't really remember. But there's the evidence because of my dad's history and medical devices. And they said it was quite nice. And so I say, okay, we have now we have a new book. Not the best book I ever seen, but we have it. And now we need to make sure that everyone can implement it and make sure that we can handle it very smoothly. That is our job as a consultant to make sure that the manufacturer, the OEM also and the PLM and also every legal manufacturer or economic operator can ensure MDR compliance. And to be honest, it's possible. Well, we lack on a few things on the organization with the MDR. Well, but at the time being, it will be available and we want that the manufacturers and the companies who work with us are also poss have the possibilities to go into market next year and may again. So that's our core business and what we are want to go. Oh, it's great. No, it's really, really great. And, and for that, so where people can, can catch up with you for uh, if they have some questions? So, um, well, mostly, I, I don't know if you can print on a line with the beonquality.com. I can. <laughs> it's it's b-on-quality.com or quite easy, you can go to the um, LinkedIn EU Medical Device Regulation Group and catch up with me directly or e as simple as LinkedIn or give me a call. I will no problem. I, I, will put, I will put all your details anywhere on the show notes so people can... can uh, can catch up with you quickly and uh, please stay for next episode also. So next week uh, we'll display also the, the second episode uh, regarding now the OEM. So we put our uh, gasket about the, the PLM. Now let's change it and put the OEM. We are now on the OEM side and what should the OEM do? So this will be the, the next episode. So thank you for that. And uh, let's uh, catch up next week for, for more information about that. So, Stefan, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Monique.